movie that came out on a snowy night for Downton Abbey. It means I am not the only Uber fan in this world. My name is Nina Torero, and I am a writer at Entertainment Weekly, and I'm so excited to be moderating the panel with our two stars tonight. Now, please give a warm welcoming hand to two stars from Downton Abbey, Hugh Bonneville and Rob Dabes Collier. Hello. Hello. So I got to ask, this weather reminds you of home, right? Yeah. Yeah, we brought it with us, especially for uh, William and Kate. We we thought they'd like it. A little bit of a homecoming, yeah. (laughs) Well, thanks for making it out on such an awful evening. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we are so excited for the upcoming season of Downton Abbey. It's finally coming to America. I've had to do my best to avoid all the spoilers from the British tabloids and magazines over there. But now you're finally going to give us a taste of what's to come, right? Absolutely. We'll tell you the whole plot if you want. (laughs) Well, I I get to ask all my questions first, so I have to start. What is going on with your marriage? Can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect? Uh, Well, we see in uh, episode one that I think it's uh, it's our 34th wedding anniversary, and uh, Robert makes the fatal mistake of uh, downgrading or even ignoring the fact that his anniversary is coming up, which is never a good thing. And then couple that with the uh, image of Richard E. Grant, uh, coming over the horizon playing an art historian, then you better lock up your etchings. That's interesting, though. So you forget the anniversary, and back in the day, you couldn't go to Hallmark to buy a balloon and a teddy bear. So what, can you, what did you have to do to make up for it? Well, he doesn't actually forget it. He just sort of thinks it's you know, nothing worth celebrating, which uh, you know, Cora takes on the chin. And they do, have a, they do have a celebration, and he does give her a very uh, you know, noble toast. But uh, the seed is sown that uh, she's being slightly ignored. Does this encourage her to perhaps chase her own desires? Well, as I say, when you've got when you've got an art historian paying a lot more interest in uh, the Della Francesca than uh, than Robert is, then uh, I think someone like Robert should uh, be very careful. <laughs> I'd say so. And your character, I mean, this storyline, the idea of discovering oneself and perhaps coming to terms with who you really are. I mean, that that couldn't feel more fresh, more pertinent. Can you tell us about perhaps your character's journey this season, what we can expect? Yeah, this season, for the first time, we see uh, Thomas really question the fact that he's gay and and, um, sets upon a journey to change who he is. Um, And he's quite an extreme person already. So he'll he'll do what any by whatever means necessary to try and um change himself um into into so he's not gay basically and try so, so he can find happiness uh, and that's pretty much thomas's journey uh, this season it's quite intense slightly harrowing um and yeah and we all know it's a fool's errand you can't change yourself so we'll, we just have to see what happens to him now i know that thomas made quite a few enemies last season when it came to the household staff and we saw a few new faces what are your relationships going to be like now with kind of your journey and again these new characters these new servants well he's still got um, um a hold over miss baxter who he's blackmailing and he knows a secret from her past so that's still going on uh, in the new series um and he's using her to manipulate and then later on in the series we have another ladies maid who comes in who doesn't see eye to eye with thomas um uh, a fantastic actress, uh, Sue Johnson. Uh, she's a bit of a legend back in the UK. So th- that she really sets the cat amongst the pigeons and it um, gets Thomas riled. And? <laughs> and, that, and that's about as much as I can say. Okay. I'll have to keep telling myself. Say it with me. January 5th. January 5th. Actually, that's when it comes January out on 4th, iTunes. January well, that's 4th. iTunes. That's iTunes. We remember, we're at the Apple Store. So season, the season pass. January 5th, available on iTunes. But I have to ask you, you're the dad. I mean, you've got a lot of responsibilities, not the least of which is kind of ensuring the health and safety of all those daughters of yours. And Mary, I'm counting on this, Mary gets a little frisky, right? Does she tell me a little bit about what when you know. When does she, she not? Well, more so than usual. <laughs> yes, yeah, she breaks the sort of ethical code even more. I mean, it was one thing having a, uh, a Turkish diplomat die on you, but... Um, <laughs> It's uh, what she gets up to in this season uh, is, is, is what we might call modern or what, she, what in her day would be called very modern and breaks various taboos. And uh, she's, you know, she's, she's playing the field. She's, she's trying to work out where, she, where happiness lies and she's determined to taste the fruit before she buys it. Hmm. Hmm. 
Are you rooting for someone though when it comes to her relationships? Do you have? Are you uh, team? Well, I, uh, yes. Robert is definitely on team Tony. T Tony Gillingham, I Lord love Gillingham, him. and uh, Charles Blake is still on the horizon. But who knows? There may be others in the mix. Hmm. Is that? Are you teasing us? Yes. Of course, I'm teasing. <laughs> Lady Mary's not fussy. I think she is. I think that's the point that she is. And um, yeah, and Edith as well. You know, I do. I do look out for my daughters. Uh, uh, Edith is. Uh, and Edith, I feel so bad for her. No, and no, she's lovely. I mean, she's there's nothing up in her life. She's uh, she's of course she's missing Charles Gregson. She hasn't got a child or anything, has she? As far as Robert is concerned, so everything is happy. <laughs> Everything's fine. Well, I guess speaking of her child, there's some child actors now on the show, right? This season, can you tell us a little bit about the dynamic that they've added to the show? Well, they do say never work with children and animals, but uh, we're blessed to actually prove that one wrong on both counts. Uh, the, uh, the, we have triplets uh, playing uh, young George. So that you is have say, triplets? Well, no, he I don't triplets? personally. Oh, my God. We, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have two boys who are two of triplets. Um, there's a, they have a sister who apparently rules the roost at home. But uh, the little twin boys of the triplets uh, alternate playing uh, young George. And they're delightful, particularly in their little sort of sailor's outfits. They look so cute. And then we have uh, Fifi playing Sibby. Uh, and she is just a real firecracker. She is hilarious. And, uh, and Alan Leach, who plays uh, Mr. Branson, is uh, very much her on-set father and, and uh, for all the kids, actually. And he's the, uh, he's the joker of the piece and keeps them all entertained. That's very cute. Now, I have to ask, on that note of having kids on set and keeping them entertained, I think a lot of us were amused. I think it was last year when that photo um, kind of came out with the water bottle in the background. And we were like, OK, that's not from the last century, right? Or <laughs> or whatnot. So tell us a little bit, like, did you guys have a kill list on set? Like, you know, maybe no converses. In the kids' case, maybe, like, no diapers. I mean, how far did you have to go this season to keep things totally historically accurate? Like, tell us. I think the water bottle was deliberate. I think it's PR genius. Because okay. okay. everyone talked about it all over the world, and the show wasn't even running. So, you know <laughs> what I mean? It's a good move. <laughs> No, I've read some very interesting things that we're not allowed to wear uh, underwear or something I was like say that. that. No, no that's tidy a load whiteies. of old bollocks. Not so that's complete rubbish. Um, we've not had any constraints on that score. Um, no, and the kids, uh, well, the kids, are, I haven't had any, any, haven't seen anything about diapers or anything like that. No, we we do, and, the, and the, yes, I've also read that the crew aren't allowed to wear Converse or something. It's equally crazy. Um, no, we we wear our costumes. We occasionally put water bottles in the wrong place. I'm blaming blaming Laura Carmichael. She's blaming me. Um, but it had a wonderful outcome in that we were able to uh, publicise a wonderful charity in Britain called uh, Water Aid. So there we go. <laughs> Well done, well done. Um, I do. I am wondering, though, on the subject of you know people talking about the show in the off season, how did things change for you in filming this new season as opposed to you know when the show first started and you didn't have quite the fan base that you have now? What were the biggest changes? Well, the biggest change, I suppose, the uh, most significant ones. Uh, I mean, in the, f in the first season. No one knew who we were, and so uh, there were no, you know, we weren't pulling photographers out of trees, put it that way, whereas in season two onwards we, we were. Uh, I was reminiscing today about the, the wedding of Mary and Matthew, and how when we filmed the sequence of uh, myself and, and Michelle Dockery uh, in the carriage coming up the street through the village of uh, our fictional Downton to the church, uh, between each take we'd have to put a blanket over our head and go back to our start position and then uh, set off again because uh, because of the amount of interest. It was like, I don't know, Lady Di's dress or something, um, trying to keep that concealed. But but the uh, I, it, I suppose I think we'd all say that it's, it's we'd rather have that amount of interest than no interest at all. And what about for you? I mean, has your life changed very much? I mean, are you able to... Well, I mean, I imagine in New York, is it as crazy walking around as it is back home? What is that like for you in terms of the level of fame? Um, well, you do get a li little bit of recognition, but it's nothing crazy. Um, it means I can get a, a, a mortgage. Um, the bank manager the bank manager is now my friend when before he looked upon me with sus suspicious eyes. Um, I doubt but that. That's it, really. Like, we're just actors. It's, it's another job. It's great that it's got this attention, but we're, not, we're by no means mega stars. The show's the mega star. We're just actors within the show. Well, I would beg to differ, but in any case, you are able to attract other A-level stars or A-list stars to this show. George Clooney 
right? He's going to have a guest role this season. Can you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. his character and what he, that'll he's be like? Technically, he's not in this season. George very kindly oh, um, Christmas special. Ca came along. No, not the Christmas special either. Let me finish, young lady. Um, I'm like, tell me, tell me. <laughs> I told you guys I was one of the fans. I'm sorry. I think, I think there was a connection between um, J um, Hugh was obviously on Monuments Men with George and I think um, Hugh helped get George on board for this uh, great charity in England called Tech Santa and we did a uh, Downton Spook, a skit, and uh, George plays Lord Hollywood, and it comes out in England on the 19th of December, and I'm pretty sure, because it is very funny, isn't it, uh, it'll go viral, so you'll all be able to watch it on YouTube Heard and the internet, here. but it's for a great charity, he was a great sport, and we've got Jeremy Piven in it as well, and it's incredibly funny, you should watch it. I will, we will, right guys? But, so, but tell me, did you just call George up and you're like, hey dude, you want to come on my show? I didn't yes, say... Yes, because that's, that's exactly how Hugh speaks. With a British accent. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> what's <dude>? up? <laughs> Hello, is that the dude? <laughs> um, no, the producer had, uh, of Downton had said that uh, we were, you know, we'd all agree to do this sketch. I hadn't seen the material at this stage. And uh, she said, what are the chances of getting George involved? And I said, zero. He's a busy man. And she said, well, don't forget that he's actually might be over in, in England a bit this summer because he's got his impending nuptials to a British lady. And uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I made the call and he said he had one afternoon in May when he was in town and he was incredibly generous with his time. And uh, as I said before, sprinkled some magic dust over our set and the number of people from production who came on set who hadn't been on set in five years was extraordinary. <laughs> Um, and uh, the amount of women on set was ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sure. That's right. No, but he was he was such a good sport and um, went the extra mile and made us all laugh. That's great. But I think what stuck out to me about what you just said is you have George Clooney's number. So maybe I'll take a look at your phone when we're done and scroll through your contacts list. <laughs> but that sounds like so much fun. And he's not the only guest star uh, or cameo I guess you'll have this season, right? There's a couple of new characters, new faces, new people. Can you tell us a little bit about new folks that we'll see this year? Well, we already mentioned Richard E. Grant and Sue Johnson, who are fantastic additions. Um, we have uh, Anna Chancellor, who uh, some of you will know, who guests as well, and she's just glorious. Uh, Harriet Walter returns again. And I think we're probably not going to mention the people from the later episodes. Uh, I'll probably get shot if I mention the fact that James Faulkner is in it, who's a wonderful actor. And um, Penny Downey coming later on, and a, a very handsome uh, young man called Matt Barber joins us as well. Oh, and he is very handsome, ladies. Annoying, annoyingly handsome. Yeah, annoyingly and handsome. And talented. And tall. Ooh. A and, and, yeah. That's and we'll leave it there. <laughs> but I guess, what do you think were the biggest differences for you in maybe your approach to script or story this time around? Because, you know, you're playing the same characters. How do you keep things exciting? Well, I think Julian uh, is the one who keeps things exciting. Like I mentioned, Thomas's journey this year. It's either all or nothing with Thomas. And, um, you know, it's always there. I don't know how he does it every year. He writes every episode. He re it's incredibly fresh every year. He finds fantastic uh, storylines, not just for one or two of the characters, but for all of the characters. So you don't have to try and, you, you know, there's no, there's no chance of you sort of resting on your laurels and, and remaining static. Uh, he just provides fresh, interesting new angles for each character every year. Um, and that's probably why he got an Oscar. Probably. It probably had something to do with it. I mean, are you inspired at all maybe to write on, maybe on your own time or produce? Has this made you think about life maybe after Downton? I think for God me... God forbid it's, such a thing, but... <laughs> I think for me it's made me realize that I should, any aspiration I had to be a writer, I should just give up. Because his work ethic, Julian Fellows, who writes every single episode, that's what people should uh, appreciate or should remember, that it's not, there's no team on this. It's just one person's imagination. Uh, with, uh, with feedback and, and constructive comment from our executive producers, but they're a very tight triumvirate with Julian at the artistic center of it. And uh, as Rob says, to be able to, you know, keep 15, 16 central characters alive through each episode and give them really three-dimensional journeys. Um, I sort of put my pen down and thought, that's it, I can't, I can't write like that. <laughs> it's too much like hard work. Uh, I mean, I tried <laughs> it, I just stared at a screen for 30 minutes and then just went surfing on the internet. I won't, I won't tell you what for. That's pretty funny. 
I have to admit... Pretty funny. Pretty funny. It's harsh. <laughs> I thought the British were all about dry humor. I mean, when in like comfort. Fair enough. Fair comment. Fair comment. <laughs> I guess I'm always really curious about odd jobs in kind of Hollywood and in the TV world. I heard that you people... Yes, you have like a... a a chef or a food stylist who creates all the period food on the show. Is that right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um, Lisa, who uh, is our on-set cook, if you like, she and uh, Alistair Bruce, who's our historical advisor, they work through all the menus that are going to be appropriate for the uh, for the scenes. And so Julian may have written, you know, lunch drawing room or something like that, at lunch in the dining room. And uh, together, Alistair and Lisa will work through what would be an appropriate menu. And all the menu cards that are on the tables are actually accurate. They're all written out, each one. They're not just, you know, handed out each time with the same one. So uh, we get a very rich and varied diet of a sort of, in our case, 1924 menu. Is there any chance, maybe, I mean, maybe has this already happened, but Downton Abbey, like, family cookbook? There's an idea. Get on For it. charity, <laughs> well, yeah. There's an unofficial one, but we're not allowed to mention it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. I don't know how they're getting away with it, but they obviously know a good liar. <laughs> Well, we, maybe you guys can you know, bring that idea up, do it for charity, as you guys have already had so much success with That's those kind That's a good of idea. We, yeah. we can get a recipe from Lord Hollywood played by George Clooney. <laughs> Pudding. But in any case, I think I've asked all the questions I'm officially allowed to tonight. It's time for audience Q&A. So I think, do we have our first one? Hi. Well, first and foremost, uh, congrats on making it through another season. I always have heart failure at every time, and I'm scared everyone of you is going to die at one point. Um, <laughs> my question is actually for Rob. Hi. Hello. Um, so you were talking about the characters' three-dimensional journeys through each episode, but I think out of all the characters throughout all the seasons, your character has gone through like the biggest journey. So I was wondering if you could only talk about that, what it was like, I guess, kind of discovering all the sides of Thomas. Um, yeah, that's a good, it's a good question because uh, as each series goes by, I guess each character evolves and... Not just it's not just the audience who find out more about Thomas. We as actors ourselves find more out, and and particularly this year, like I say, um, whereas in series gone by, Thomas never apologised for his homosexuality and being a gay man, and he wasn't ashamed of it. There's a new twist this year, um, you know, where he starts to think maybe society's not going to allow it. Maybe I do need to change. So the first time ever we see sort of, um, you know, Thomas really vulnerable and. And that's a kind of a new um, area for me to be in as an actor uh, and really refreshing because then you have to sort of get in, del delve into his psyche, research, how would he feel, you know, put yourself in his shoes, try and substitute to make them scenes as believable as they can be. Um, and I hope I've done that this series and it's been such a long and rambling answer that I forgot the original question. But I hope in some way I've answered it. But I don't... I don't think I have by your face. I am so sorry. Oh, I have. Thank you. I love you. Merry Christmas. Hi. I have a question for Rob, too. Sorry, Hugh. Hello again. Hi again. Um, in a lot of your previous work before Downton, like Down to Earth and Coronation Street, you play a definite womanizer. And I was wondering if it's ironic to you or a strategic uh, career move that Thomas is, as Mrs. Patmore says, certainly not a ladies' man. And uh, if that's what you're famous for or if in England people still know you as the skirt chaser on Corey. Um, um, well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a career move in terms of, I didn't say to my agent after Corey, the next character I play must be gay and he must be Edwardian and slightly evil. Um, but... <laughs> But there is sense in what you say, as in um, there was a premeditate. I, like, I didn't work for 15 months after Coronation Street because I didn't want to play, like you said, the womanizer, the cheeky chappy. I wanted to play somebody different. And um, thankfully, Downton came along and Thomas was that somebody completely different and allowed me to come clear from the roles that you've mentioned that I played before were all the very same sort of roles. And it allowed me to completely come away from that um, and it you know and it was worth the wait well Thomas was worth the wait I I think he was anyway so yeah thank you good question hi good evening uh, I like you is your mother-in-law coming back this year uh, Shirley MacLaine yes. uh, she's not coming back this season oh, I'm afraid okay. to say but uh, we would love to see her again she's such good value when she turns up okay thank you <laughs> 
Hi, this is for both of you. Um, if you could play any other character on the show, regardless of uh, gender and age, who would it be? <laughs> Pretend you could do either gender. Um, who would I be? I will. I think it, the obvious. Well, I'd, I'd just be Dame Maggie because she gets all the best one-liners. And I said it last night, but I'll say it again. You get to wear a nice frock. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm on Team Molesley. I I just adore him as a character. And also, this is uh, for the for the writers out there. This is uh, an interesting case in point. Kevin was only with us for a, a few episodes uh, originally, in, in, the, in the as a sort of almost like a guest artist in the first season. But Julian sp spotted how brilliant Kevin was with the material and has developed him into now a really central uh, part of the ensemble. And uh, I just adore him as a character. He can. He can do comedy, you know, slapstick, you know, visual comedy, physical comedy, and he can do great pathos as well. I adore him as an actor, and, and uh, it's a great character. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, this question is for either one of you. Um, what is the funniest thing um, that happened while filming this past season? Uh. <laughs> That's always a really hard one. Um, and when you relay any anecdotes, they're never funny. Um, it is a hard one because every day, and this is genuine, like I, th I think you guessed a bit tonight, I just like to have a laugh. So every day we all do just, we take it very seriously, but we just have the crack, have not crack, co crack cocaine, that's an Irish expression, C-R-A-I-C. Um, we have a good time, we have a laugh. So there's not, there's not really one standout moment, you know, where... I don't know. I think, I think my, my favourite memory, actually, and I think I mentioned this at a Q&A last night, was... Uh, the way that Alan Leach, as I say, who's the entertainer of the outfit, uh, it's certainly in the upstairs department, he uh, he beguiles the children because he they, they, they think that he can control the fire in the fireplace. Little do they know that there's a guy with a gas canister behind the sofa. And so when he does that, the flames go up and the kids are just completely, they think he's a wizard. And uh, to see the giggles and delight on their faces, that's been really charming. Um... <coughs> I've came, I came all the way from San Diego, so I need to make the most of it. Wow. You were there, you were there last night, weren't yeah. you, as well? Yeah. Welcome back. I heard so. you'd hook up with Jimmy, so... <laughs> um, <laughs> That's, that's quite fantastic. Thank that's you. Um, quite special. What, um, what would Thomas's perfect man be? Ooh. Uh, he, Spare no detail. The great thing is, Thomas has already met his perfect man. It's George, it's George Clooney, Lord Hollywood. And uh, he's been lucky enough to do a scene with him. Um, so yeah, it would probably be someone like that, a dashing American, he's exotic, he comes in, he's got a different accent, you know, something like that. Yeah, something like that. It's somebody in the aristocracy anyway. He, he likes a duke. For Mr. Bonneville, um, it, there was a lot of sexism involved in your relationship with your daughter at certain points and struggles over the, the land and whatnot. Um, do you have any particular opinions about the way that's played out? Well, two things. I would say that uh, our view of sexism is very different to the way things were in those, in those days, I would suggest. The second thing I would observe is that uh, uh, from Robert's point of view, he was protecting Mary. He wasn't trying to steal the land off her. He, she was in grief. And Robert, wrong though he may have been in his approach to how you cope with grief, his idea was to really wrap her in cotton wool and protect her. Uh, and that George was in no condition, obviously, to take over the estate yet, and that it was his duty to maintain. And bearing in mind that since his day of birth, Robert's d duty has been to preserve the estate. And if he's got a, a fragile daughter, from his point of view, a fragile daughter who is grieving and is in no fit state to run the thing with him, then it's up. You know, it's his responsibility to manage the estate in, in the best way he can. You and I will probably disagree as human beings that that's not the right way to approach it, but that's the way Robert did because of uh, the time in which he lived. Hi, huge fan of the show. Um, so I just wanted to know what has been each of your favorite scenes to play throughout all the seasons? Um, I, I, I love the stuff at the end of series three um, where Thomas uh, is being threatened to be exposed um, and the scene with Mr. Carson, um, where Mr. Carson describes him as a twisted, foul creature, and Thomas, you know, stands very tall and says, you know, I'm not foul. Uh, I'm, I may not be like you, but I'm not foul, Mr. Carson. And it's just said with real humility and, and 
you just thought, fair play to you, standing up um, in a time, you know, when everything, all the odds were against you. And I just, it was a lovely, a beautifully crafted scene by Julian. Thomas didn't speak in it much. He was, it was just the reactions from Mr. Carson. And um, Jim was, was played a blinder in the scene as well. So for me, that's um, a real, because it was a real turning point in Thomas's journey. So that would be my favorite one. I think uh, for me, it was really because it was filmed against the odds. There was a scene at the end after Sybil's death, when uh, Robert and Cora have been estranged, and uh, Violet contrives to bring them back together via Doctor Clarkson, telling a, a half truth about the, the circumstances of Sybil's death. And the reason I, I I'm proud of that scene or in, remember it vividly is because it was about five to seven. We wrap at seven. We don't do overtime, and it was uh, it was Elizabeth's close up, and it was a really really hard call on her with the pressure on. To uh, we, we were way behind schedule, and she pulled it out of out of the bag, and she was amazing in that scene. And it was a very tender, del it was a very delicate scene to get right. And when you're under pressure, that's when your <clears throat> your acting boots need to be firmly tied on. And uh, bless her, she she really pulled it out of the bag, as did Maggie and uh, David Robb as well. So I, that's very vivid in my memory. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Hugh and Rob, for taking the time out to be with us tonight. I can speak for everyone when I just say thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you all for coming down, Thanks. by the way. We thank really, you. really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. And remember... Downton Abbey airs in the United States on January 4th, the new season starts. And on January 5th, you can get your season pass for this season on iTunes. Thank you so much. I'm Nina Turo from Entertainment Weekly. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>